This past week, Matt Pagano, a bright student I first met at Mount San Antonio College a couple of years back, asked me to give a presentation to the Philosophy Club at the University of California, Irvine, in the latter part of May. I readily accepted, since it would give me the opportunity of putting the final touches on a paper that has been bubbling forth in my brain for the past few months. It concerns the idea that the advent of virtual and augmented reality in the past four decades can serve as useful model and tool to better understand why human consciousness first evolved. Following the pioneering work of Nobel Prize winners Gerald Edelman and Francis Crick, along with distinguished scientists V.S. Ramachandran, Christoph Koch, Giulio Tononi and others, the thesis is a simple one though with profound implications. Any organism that can develop an insourcing mechanism that allows it to virtually simulate varying options before outsourcing them has a distinct advantage over those creatures which are limited in their responses because of instinctual parameters. Put in simpler terms, Consciousness is a virtual simulator par excellence and as such allows humans to have a rolodex of potential strategies when navigating in a world with ever-changing competitive concerns and environmental niches. The essential key here is to examine our own self-awareness and witness what it actually does moment to moment and then see how it relates to our Darwinian struggle of existence. Taking this approach, it becomes fairly obvious what is happening and why. Even as you read through this article, whether reading it closely and skimming through it, you will notice that your mind wanders. The question to ask is this, where does it wander to? Long-time meditators have called our wavering attention a monkey mind, swinging from one thought to another. But if you watch closely, you will start to see some fundamental patterns, even if what you are thinking about varies. We oscillate from past concerns to future plans to present activities. But all the while we are mostly unconsciously creating scenarios about what to do or what to avoid or what we wish. In so doing, we are developing temporary narratives in which to plan our days ruminate about previous mistakes, or envelop ourselves in imaginary fantasies which intertwine what has happened or could happen with a series of desired outcomes. All the while we are, to invoke Dr. Gerald Edelman's terminology, dissociating from the present moment and what it has on offer and becoming absorbed in our second nature. Michio Kaku, professor of theoretical physics at the City College of New York and CUNY Graduate Center, articulates the virtual simulation hypothesis of consciousness very clearly in his book, The Future of the Mind, and in an interview for Popular Mechanics, conducted by Alison Shepard. Well, I, Michio Kaku, have a new theory of consciousness, and that is, Consciousness is all the feedback loops necessary to create a model of yourself in space, in relationship to others, and in time, especially forward in time. This means that animals are conscious, and we can even rank them numerically by counting the number of feedback loops involved in each of these behaviors. So a thermostat would have one unit of consciousness that measures temperature. A flower would have maybe 10 units of consciousness because it measures temperature, sunlight, gravity, moisture, things like that. A reptile would have even more, maybe several hundred, because it locates its position in space. Then monkeys are even higher than that because they have to locate their ranking in society via emotions. We are at the highest level because we daydream. We see the future. We predict the future, and animals do not. Animals, to the best of our knowledge, have no concept of our tomorrow. We are obsessed with planning, strategizing, and tomorrow. And that, I think, typifies human consciousness. Kaku's theory 
Contrary to his claim that it is a new one, dovetails in several ways with other theorists in the field, who were in agreement that having the ability to simulate all sorts of end-game scenarios gives human beings an advantage over other creatures who lack such. I often give three examples in my philosophy courses to illustrate this. 1. Imagine we are on a 747 jet flying from Los Angeles to New York when we learn that all of the pilots have inexplicably passed out. The steward goes up and down the aisle to find anyone who has even the modicum of training to see if they can somehow take over and land the plane. There are several volunteers, but they have no experience flying. However, there is a 14-year-old boy who has been playing a VR flight simulator game obsessively for the past two years and is conversant with some of the controls on large jets. Given this scary scenario, who would you choose? The kid who has flight simulator experience or an older adult? I suspect most of us would pick the 14-year-old and for good reason. The second example I give is a bit cruder and is probably more relatable to our own life experiences. There are two different men, Tom and Bob, and each of them want to ask a woman out that they saw in the Whole Foods market. Tom is impulsive and instinctive and tends to never think before acting. Bob, on the other hand, is a planner and is a great visualizer. Before asking out the woman, he imagines different stylistic approaches and after weighing them out, chooses one that he believes is the best way to introduce himself. Tom, though, is the complete opposite and simply walks up to the woman and says what he really wants from her without any editing. While we cannot be sure how the particular woman in question will respond, Bob would, statistically speaking, seem to have the better odds in succeeding in his quest than Tom. Interestingly, popular culture even has a term for Bob's potential successes. He has game, which in this context means he has a better array of simulations from which to draw. The third example is one that has been employed by a number of evolutionary psychologists and is perhaps the most illustrative. In our ancestral past, those individuals who could better predict the behavior of a predator would, on average, have more opportunities to pass on their genetic code. Thus, any creature, and it doesn't have to merely default to Homo sapiens, which can concoct multiple reactions and strategies within itself before acting on them, has leverage over those who have a limited repertoire. Mnemonic. Functions of the hypothalamus, the four Fs. Feeding, fighting, flighting, sexual functioning. Yet, there is a downside in possessing a higher form of consciousness, since it allows its owner to ponder all sorts of improbable events that will never actually happen. We too often can get ensnared with our ideas, our fantasies, our projections, and begin believing all sorts of nonsense. For a robust virtual simulator to work, it must conjure up a plethora of scenarios that mix and match incongruent narratives. In other words, for imagination to work, it must be massively elastic. The glitch is that sometimes our simulations overtake us and we get entrapped within their corridors. To the degree that we can test our imaginings in the empirical world and acknowledge their successes and failures, we are regarded as somewhat sane. To the degree that we cannot, we may be viewed as somewhat insane. It is a thin line, indeed, that separates the two. In trying to understand consciousness, differing models have been proposed over the years by scientists and philosophers, ranging from variations of Cartesian dualism, mind is primary, body is merely a vehicle, to neural correlate theory, mind is the brain and arises due to complex interactions. Consciousness Diagram The Inner Self 1. The nervous system in the body. 
The body captures data from the internal and external stimuli and delivers behaviors into the external environment. 2. The mind and its worldview. Mostly unconscious interactions between emotions and thoughts, forming concepts and building meaning. 3. The mental states and their attitudes. Specific temporal configurations of a worldview and its various possibilities of potential behavior. 4. The process of decision making. Choosing of specific potential behavior out of a wide range of options. 5. The outer self. The expression of the chosen behavior. Expression of the world view through an action performed by the body in the external environment. Even popular science shows, such as David Eagleman's The Brain on PBS, provides a radical summation of how reality is virtually constructed. Dr. Eagleman takes viewers on an extraordinary journey that explores how the brain, locked in silence and darkness without direct access to the world, conjures up the rich and beautiful world we all take for granted. What is reality? begins with the astonishing fact that this technicolor, multi-sensory experience we are having is a convincing illusion, conjured up for us by our brains. In the outside world, there is no color, no sound, no smell. These are all constructions of the brain. Instead, there is electromagnetic radiation, air compression waves and aromatic molecules all of which are interpreted by the brain as color, sound, and smell. Cutting-edge graphics show that data from the outside are rendered into electrochemical signals inside the brain, which map meaningfully onto physical reality. Our experience of reality is an electrochemical rendition of the world outside. It is not a faithful rendition. Visual illusions are reminders that what's important to the brain is not being faithful to reality, but being able to perceive just enough so that we can navigate successfully through it. The brain leaves a lot out of its beautiful rendition of the physical world, a fact that Dr. Eagleman reveals using experiments and street demonstrations. We meet the men and women whose experiences of reality reveal important clues about how the brain constructs our own reality, including the Alcatraz prisoner who was locked in the notorious dark hole for 29 days and yet experienced richly colorful moments of reality. His experience, along with those who have experienced total sensory deprivation, show us that even when sensory input to the brain stops, the show still goes on. Why? Because, amazingly, our senses, eyes, ears, skin, nose, only modulate an internally generated simulation of what the brain expects is out there. This so-called internal model of reality allows us to move through the world, recognizing it rather than constructing it anew, moment by moment. We meet a man who is blind, despite the fact that he has eyes that can see. His story reveals that it's the brain that sees, not our eyes. A woman with schizophrenia, whose psychotic episodes were her reality, emphasizes the fact that whatever our brains tell us is out there, we believe it. We have no way to get beyond what our brains allow us to perceive. Like the rest of the animal kingdom, we inhabit a minuscule slice of reality, and yet we believe it to be the whole picture. Eagleman also explores time and takes a look at how and why the brain alters its perception of time depending on the situation we find ourselves in. Time, it turns out, is not an absolute to the brain. Each one of our brains is different, and so is the reality it produces. 
What is reality? It's whatever your brain tells you it is. Perhaps what is most intriguing is what virtual reality holds for us in the future, particularly when VR and AI are intertwined. The disruptive nature of both will undoubtedly completely transform how we live. We have already witnessed the worldwide acceptance of smartphones, which, lest we forget, are powerful computers connected to the cloud and how they can moment-to-moment -moment augment our navigating intelligence in ways unimaginable decades prior. The Physics of the Astral Plane It is rich with irony that our consciousness, which evolved as a virtual simulator, would, over time, and with the advent of sophisticated technology, develop virtual reality headsets that enable us to live in ultra-realistic worlds that before were merely figments of our imagination. As I wrote in the book The Avatar Project, I have no doubt that with VR we will soon be witnessing an informational tsunami, the likes of which will swamp everything, from how we educate, to how we doctor, to how we entertain. If consciousness evolved as a virtual simulator to help us better insource varying survival strategies before outsourcing them, we can readily see that humans have now progressed to the point where we can actualize our imaginings in a real world. Simply put, our technology has finally caught up with our dreams so that we can consciously inhabit what we could only before imagine. Aldous Huxley was correct when he predicted that we would enter a brave new world, but it is a different kind of soma we will daily ingest than the one he anticipated. The drug of the future is virtual, and it is information without boundaries.